welcome to the fifth training movie in the Coral Finder Toolkit 2.0 training movie series. In an action-packed previous movie, we introduced the Meandering Key Group and learned some techniques for working with meandering corals in all their forms. Now we are going to explore the massive and thick colony key group using two learning groups to simplify some common problems. A learning group compares and contrasts small groups of Indo-Pacific coral genera that cause problems for beginners new to coral identification. Each learning group comes with a simple recipe for solving these problems. These recipes may not be very exciting, but believe me, they are a whole lot better than not having a recipe. So gentle viewer, think of my recipes as being like muesli. Not very exciting, but very good for you. You'll thank me later. Back to the massive and thick colony key group. Let's start by defining just what we mean by a massive coral. You may be surprised to learn that the term massive coral colony does not refer to the coral's size, but rather its form. A massive coral colony is a mound or dome with roughly similar dimensions in any direction. Length, width, height. Like this colony. If the coral grows flat in one dimension, then we might refer to the coral colony as submassive, which still keeps us in the massive key group. But when the colony becomes very flat, though still solid, we might say the colony was thick encrusting. From the perspective of the coral finder's logic, somewhere between thick encrusting and thin encrusting, there is a transition to the thin plates key group. You will need to make this call regularly when you dive. Have an opinion and test yourself. You'll soon fine tune your judgment. But be warned, massive and submassive are often incorrectly used to infer the size of the colony. In coral identification, it helps everyone if when you say massive coral, you actually mean massive coral. All these forms are the one species. This is not unusual. The final shape of a colony is determined by many factors, among them physical habitat, competition with other species, and the disturbance history, which can include storms, runoff, sediment, nutrients, and thermal stress. This Diploastria colony has been affected by either crown of thorn starfish or coral bleaching. With time and the water, you will learn to recognize the complex ecological life histories reef species have had. Now, inspect the massive or thick colony key group on the front page of your coral finder. Note how it specifically excludes corals with meandering coralites, which have their own key group. So by this reasoning, of the four corals shown here, we would pursue two using the massive key group and the other two using the meandering key group. Okay, so we've decided to use the massive key group. Now browse this key group's pages to see how it works. Note each page is based around simple, well-defined concepts. Wall type, scale, and surface textures. Let's follow how this approach pans out. Pages 10, 11, 13, 14, and 15 of the Coral Finder use wall structure and scale to separate small groups of common genera. We can further separate these genera by then referring to the descriptions for details of the scepter, costi, and ornament. Back at the key page, we can see that page 12 contains genera with no coralite walls and scepter costi. Note the genera on this page, Samacora, Costnerea, 
and Pavona. These three common genera can be confusing for beginners, and for that reason, they form the Septocosti Learning Group. So, the first step in our recipe for coral identification happiness is to limit the scope of the problem. In this case, we need to recognize Septocosti when they occur in massive, thick coral colonies. Here is a quick summary of what you need to know. For more detail, go back and watch Coral Finder Toolkit Training Movie 2. Septocosti are the structures that run between coralite centers when there is no wall or the wall is indistinct. Septocosti can be smooth or rough due to the presence of teeth or ornament. In some coral genera, septocosti can be very small and granular, like fine sandpaper, making them easy to ignore. Finally, the presence of septocosti can be masked when a coral develops ornamental ridges on the colony surface, or the septocosti combined with ridges produced by the way the coral grows, or the coral has its tentacles extended hiding the surface structures. On page 12 of the Coral Finder, we are looking at examples of septocosti that have developed on corals with a massive or thick growth form. Now let's look at how to treat this page as a learning group. You will recall in Training Movie 4, I told you that after scanning the lookalike page for a visual match, the first step was to check the orange true scale box. Remember, most mistakes occur when users do not check the scale. Pause this movie for a few seconds so you can check just how small the coralites of Samacora and Cosnorea really are. Now compare them to the orange scale box for Pavona, whose coralites are significantly larger. Also, have a look at the magnified scale images next to the orange true scale boxes. Note that Samacora and Cosnorea also have granular septocosti, while those of Pavona are smooth. So here is our recipe for the septocosti learning group. If you have a massive thick coral, and you recognize that it has septocosti, then the Coral Finder sends us to page 12 and tells us we are most likely dealing with Samacora, Cosnorea, or Pavona. If the coralites are tiny, around one to two millimeters, and the septocosti are granular, then we are looking at either Samacora or Cosnorea. If the coralites are two millimeters or greater and smooth, then we are dealing with Pavona. Here are some important tips. If you are having trouble seeing coralites underwater, then you are almost certainly looking at Samacora or Cosnorea. Note, a hand lens is a really useful tool to have when identifying corals. Samacora has a texture like fine sandpaper, and the tiny polyps often make leaf or flower like patterns. By contrast, Cosnorea has polyps and corallites that are a little larger. Underwater, these colonies appear to have a coarser, sugary texture. By contrast, Pavona colonies have clear, clean, flowing, non-granular septocosti. Among these three genera, Samacora and Cosnorea commonly show subtle, rounded ridges and valleys housing groups of coralites. But when Pavona produces ornamental ridges on the colony surface, they tend to be sharp edged.
So that's the end of the SEPTA COSTI Learning Group. Learning groups are worth committing to memory as they solve a common problem you will encounter on any dive. Now here is the subject matter for our next learning group. Pause this video to familiarise yourself with the separate and common wall pages of the massive key group of the Coral Finder. Notice how four genera occur more than once. Favia, Montastria, Favites and Goniastria. Each of these genera have more or less rounded corallites but with different wall structures. Together they make up the rounded corallite learning group, a learning group within the massive thick colony key group. Here's the problem. To the beginner, Favia looks like Montastria and Favites looks like Goniastria. Sometimes Favia can also look like Favites. These genera are very common and generally easily separated once you know how. The recipe for the rounded corallite learning group requires some new terms related to the way the coral polyps clone themselves, a process called budding. Please look at the glossary page of your coral finder. All colonial corals build or clone new polyps. The corallites that these polyps build expand the coral colony. While coral budding is interesting, we don't generally use it in the coral identification process except when trying to separate the genera Favia and Montastria. So you need to understand what budding is and when to use it as an aid to identification. There are two types of budding we need to learn, intratentacular and extratentacular. Here are some examples of intratentacular budding in the genus Favia. Intratentacular refers to the new polyp bud forming within the ring of tentacles that surround the polyp mouth. It is said that the parent polyp splits into two daughter polyps. The process of budding occurs over time and has a beginning, middle and end. Here we have some good examples of extratentacular budding, where the buds form outside of the tentacle ring and the polyp's oral disc. Pause the movie and study them if you wish. Note, in some corals, a consequence of extratentacular budding is for the colony surface to sometimes appear crowded due to the new clones. Sometimes a coral will unhelpfully show both types of budding. This is because the later stages of intratentacular budding can sometimes look like extratentacular budding. I find it helps to remember that budding is a messy, three-dimensional process that builds the colony over time. It is therefore normal to have different budding stages in the same coral. So take an overview of the colony and don't fixate on the one coralite alone. It is important to remember that corals start from a single polyp which clones itself to form a colony over time. However, coral growth is not a constant process. It varies with the seasons and the health of the coral. For example, a coral that is under stress from disease, coral bleaching or fierce competition may not be actively growing. So be prepared to not find budding in a coral that is not growing. If you really want to find a coral's budding state, sometimes it pays to swim around the habitat and look for another example of the same coral. So let's put this knowledge to work separating Favia and Montastria. These colonies show the classic differences. Not all colonies will be this helpful but this is the mental image you need to channel. Here are two more examples using species with larger corallites. In reality, as you gain coral ID experience, you learn to recognise the unique look of a genus first, and then you look at the budding to confirm. 
Here are some more examples to help give you a sense of the natural variation in look and feel that you will find on a reef. As with all things relating to coral ID, there is no substitute for time in the water looking at corals. Those budding tips helped us identify the separate wall genera Favia and Montastria. Now we will look at the common wall genera in the rounded coralite learning group, identifying Favites and Goniastria. Here we employ another new term. Look at the glossary page of your coral finder for paliform lobes. Part of the challenge of coral taxonomy is understanding features of both the living animal, the polyp, and the skeleton home it makes, the coralline. To become truly expert at coral identification requires a good knowledge of the coral skeleton. To separate Goniastria and Favites, we need to recognise paliform lobes, a feature best seen in a bleached coral skeleton. Paliform lobes are vertical pillars or blades that rise from the inner edge of septa. When well developed, they appear to form a circular crown. Paliform lobes occur in many different types of corals. However, the only time you need to think about them is when you are trying to recognise the genus Goniastria and separate it from Favites. In general, it is not necessary to collect corals to check for the presence of paliform lobes. Just use your hands to waft water on the polyps, encouraging them to withdraw into the skeleton. This often accentuates the presence of paliform lobes and makes them easier to see. Remember, unless you are collecting specimens for taxonomic study, it is better to leave corals alone. Touching a coral causes damage where the tissue and the skeleton rub together, which encourages infection and disease. Goniastria can be a bit mysterious for the beginner. But the fine, regular, neat scepter do create a distinctive look. You just need to learn that look. Here's a tip. Several Goniastria species are common on reef flats or rocky shores. These intertidal habitat specialists resist occasional exposure to air or rain at extreme low tides by coating themselves in mucus. Also, Goniastria has some meandering species. In the case of long valley species like Goniastria australensis, the paliform lobes appear as a bench along the side of the valley wall. Now for Favites. When side by side with Goniastria, the differences are usually quite evident though hard to put into words. Paliform lobes are absent or less prominent. And the appearance of the scepter and therefore the colony overall is, for most species, less neat, less regular. Well, that finishes our epic journey through the rounded coralite learning group. I hope you can see how chunkalizing problems helps the human mind to keep the coral chaos under control. By mastering the coral finder's glossary terms, key groups, and learning groups, you will have the tools you need to identify over 70 hard coral genera. Remember, the best way to improve at coral identification is to spend more time in the water looking at corals. Finally, here are some tips for what to do if you can't find your coral genus using the coral finder. Tip number one, change key group. Always keep an open mind and be prepared to change the key group even if you need to bend the logic a bit. For example, this image is actually a meandering coral with very short meanders. On first glance, you might have been tempted to try the massive coral key group. The coral finder is just a guide, and it's okay to bend the key group rules, so long as you confirm the details in the genus descriptions. Tip number two, reverse the wall structure. 
Sometimes, genera like Favia and Favites develop colonies with ambiguous wall structures. The simplest solution here is to just try the opposite wall structure. It takes 10 seconds. Tip number three, check the comments section. When nothing else works, it's time to check the comments section at the bottom of the page. The Coral Finder's design promotes the common or typical forms of coral genera. Rare, unusual, or exceptional examples are listed in the comments section with a page reference to corals of the world. So that's it. The reality is that the answer to most coral inquiries is in the Coral Finder somewhere. And if you are not seeing the answer, then you just need to think laterally. If you have enjoyed the Coral Finder's visual approach to problem solving, then please visit the BYO Guides website for other easy to use underwater ID tools and details of forthcoming training and capacity building courses. See you there.